Hello, I'm Emma Goswell and welcome to FN Hormones. It's the podcast about perimenopause and beyond. It's basically me and my three mates, Helen, Bina and Terry, and we are all messed about by our hormones to some degree or another. Now, I'm menopausal, Bina and Terry are peri, and Helen, well, she has to be different, doesn't she? She's got a histamine intolerance, which can also mess with your hormones. Now, in this episode, you're going to hear from a very filthy, very wise and very funny woman called Marnie Riches. She's an award-winning writer. She's also a tutor in the written word. She writes crime novels featuring cool, strong, kick-ass women. Uh, We recorded Marnie earlier in the summer and had a reeked old laugh. Now, Bina, you sadly weren't able to be with us for that interview, but since then you've heard it. How would you describe Marnie? Well, I think she's refreshingly sweary, uh, but full of optimism. And I completely love that she gives zero fucks. Totally <laughs> gives no fucks. <laughs> she Absolutely. really doesn't, I, she? I, I was genuinely like, yeah, I, st- I was midway through cooking when I was listening and I properly stopped and laughed out loud at some of the stuff she was saying. It's just great. It's just great to hear someone who's just so like kind of high on life. Also just dealing with it as it comes, as it's hitting her. But yeah, I, I think it's uh, it's a great interview and I think everyone's going to really enjoy it. And definitely don't listen to it whilst kids are in your car or anything <laughs> like that. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> right. Is, is this an official Ockham warming type thing? I, I would say so. I would say so. Just, just uh, yeah, not safe for work. Or maybe, maybe safe for work, but definitely not safe for kids. <laughs> if you work with lots of sweary people that are happy talking about sexual things as well, Put it on. Pop it on in the office. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> you might get a few dodgy looks. <laughs> Helen, how have you been in the intervening time between last episode? Do you know, I'm doing all right, actually. I have been um, doing my super duper diet and I've been really working on my yoga because sometimes like you can go through, do the yoga and it's a bit of a like, yeah, I'm not really going to, I'm not really going to lean into it that much. But I don't know. I'm feeling good at the moment. Hooray. I'm feeling good. And are you missing booze at all? Because I think I'd struggle with that. Do you know what, actually? This is really interesting, and, I, and I've just remembered this. When we went, we went on holiday, and we had a fantastic week away in Pembrokeshire. Had a shout out to the Pembrokeshire shout Massive! Shout out to the Pembrokeshire <laughs> Massive, because, uh, you know, that's, uh, uh, your family's uh, based there. And, and, yes, and Mrs. Um, Mrs. Um, well. Yeah, hiya. Um, and we randomly bumped into some really good friends of ours who we just haven't seen for the past six years, right? And I had this whole grapple about about seeing them and thinking, what if they think I'm boring because I can't drink anymore? Oh, I'm genuinely. I'm I did wonder kidding. where this story was going. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, you know, back in the day, I mean, it's only six or seven years ago, right, that, you know, I mean, our, our, we went out a lot, you know, and we partied together. And it just, it really sort of slammed home to me, like, how boring you've become. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, but honestly, yeah, I did think that. I, I grew up in a home where my um, my mum was a recovering alcoholic, is a recovering alcoholic. So I had, we had some of the best parties at our house with all recovering alcoholics. So there wasn't a drop of alcohol in, those, in, in any of those parties. Mm. So you can have life after alcohol. It was just really interesting. It's not something that I've really gone, oh my God, I don't drink anymore, how terrible. But it was just, it was a wobble. It was a wobble. And it, cause it, it, it's because it's a different, it was a different me. I'm a different mm. me. Do you know what I mean? And it yeah, you're grown up. Sort of... You're middle aged now. Yeah, whatever. Well, <laughs> shut up. Well, I guess, but I guess as well, like, because we've kind of lived in, been living in pandemic times and it's not mm. like, oh, should we just yeah, pop to the pub? I've not been out. You've not had that pressure. No. Or that, no, listen, those environments. This was a day on the beach. I mean, they were just hanging out. There was no pressure. But they, they had all this lovely picnic and they were all kitted out because they were in a motorhome and stuff. And um, and, and they just got out um, a nice ice-cold tin of um, gin and tonic, you know, to, and, and, and cracked it over. They were having a lovely time. And I was thinking, oh, I can't, I can't do that mm. anymore. So mm. I think that's why it gave me a wobble because it was, yeah, because we haven't been out for such a long time as well. So there are, big, there are bigger things here at play than just that, I think. But yeah. you'll feel, you know that yeah, you feel so much that. better yeah. inside and in your body, don't you, through, through not drinking? Yeah, I mean, it's more of a question of not getting ill, really. It's just no point. There's no point. Yeah. And uh, meanwhile, Terry, what are you swigging while we're recording? 
<laughs> Do you know what? I was just going to share this with you. It's a Heineken Zero, so it's alcohol free it? lager. Yeah. So I've actually been on these since last year. I don't, I, I don't drink really anymore. Oh. When I have, if I have any kind of alcohol, yeah, we're going to be really boring when we meet up, uh, Emma. Um, I know. <laughs> no, 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 Emma, I'm with you, mate. I'm with you. <laughs> no, actually, no, no. I'm saying that I do have. So if I meet people, I do have the odd drink, but actually, I'm a bit like Helen. I feel better without it at the moment, and and it just adds yeah. to all the other issues of perimenopause and, and anxiety and everything else so i'm actually finding it's it's Funny. nice to feel like i'm having a drink but not actually having the effects of it secretly i wish i could do it but i just even though i know it's not good for me and i know it doesn't help with my hot sweats or anything else in my life or my anxiety i do like a little drink every now and again so at least I've got one friend I can go drinking with because they're getting less and less. <laughs> say, the people that have come to the pub with me and have a boo- boozy drink. I'm there. You know, I don't want anybody to stop drinking. You know what I mean? I, I want everybody to carry on enjoying themselves. Well, it's now time to return to the A to Z of Perry and Manor, where you get to hear all about different aspects of it all as we work our way steadily through the alphabet. And amazingly, we have got to the letter G, uh, which stands for many things, including... GPs, and you will not believe this, girls, but after, I mean, I'm going to say several months of trying, I haven't tried every day. I have spent some days, though, ringing my doctors between the prescribed time of half past eight in the morning and nine o'clock, nine or ten or eleven times. It Mm. was only on Tuesday this week when I rang 13 times did I finally get through to my GP. Oh, my God. Boom! Um, I mean, the fact that we even have to applause that is just, yeah, yeah, it's quite quite bad, that, isn't it? It's It's, pants, that, really. It it? is really quite bad. But I built up so many things that I needed to bring them about. I thought, I'm really going to have to try. And I did Terry's technique of ringing five minutes before that. um, And somehow I managed to get through. Now, I understand we are in a pandemic and I'm not the only person that's had this problem. I've listened to many people on radio phone-ins complaining, going, I can't get hold of a GP. And, you know, it's difficult and it's tough times. Well, finally, I got an appointment. No, no, like, going in or, you know, sitting down with anybody. No, there's just a telephone appointment. Mm. But I told them that I wanted to give up my antidepressants because, remember, I was given those nearly almost a year ago, actually. And I said, I I don't think I've had any benefit from them. This particular man who I'd never spoken to before said, you know, yes, they are commonly prescribed for the menopause. and Yeah, we know that. And we're like, (laughs) yes, I know. But I don't think they're doing any good. So I said, can I just come off them? To which he said, yes, I'm just taking half the amount now. And then next week I will be taking none. And I think I'll be absolutely fine and I don't think I've had any benefit from those antidepressants and then I've said I've had to go private I've had to spend a lot of money getting HRT can you look at getting me it um, maybe through your systems instead and I'm now just taking in today my prescription from my private clinic oh, wow. so that um, they can actually look at it and then look at maybe getting me HRT and see oh, if that's wow. working and doing it that way results yes hooray Hey! So, yes, it's been a long journey, hasn't it? But um, I'm finally going to come off the antidepressants, which I never wanted in the first place, and hopefully there'll be some point I will move forward and actually get HRT from my GP. So it's been a, it's been a long, um, turbulent journey over the last year. But, you know, and this just goes to show that it is a long journey, isn't it? You, you don't get mm. the answer that you want from your GP straight away. And it just goes to show how different GPs are. I mean, even in that one practice, there's that many GPs. I might get a different answer from all of them. It's just mm. one thing that this podcast has taught me and talking to all these different women has taught me is just that you have to keep pushing and you have to keep ask- asking and you can't just be turned away the first time. Did yeah, you get maybe. a sense that your GP understood menopause? Mm, I didn't particularly, no. But no. he was willing to listen to me okay. um, yeah. and consider it. So that's all I've got to go off, really. It would have been better if I could have sat down and sat face to face with him. But as it was, I was walking around uh, Healydale yeah. Nature Reserve while trying to walk a um, aggravated Labrador. Um, <laughs> so it was quite. You know, I feel like I wasn't really concentrating fully on the conversation, really. But um, mm. yeah. Well, the, yeah. The... I mean, yeah. It's. I mean, I had I had a very long conversation in a car park. If you remember, I literally mm. stood there. I was mm. like, if I don't have this conversation now in this car mm. park. Mm. 
and I'm no, I'm not even anywhere near my car to go and sort of sit in it. And I was sort of in between places, and and you, you just have to grab it, don't you? Just like I have to have this conversation oh, now because no, it's taken do. me so long to get to this point. Exactly. I'm like <laughs> having this really private conversation. I'm walking past other dog walkers, going, "Yes, well, I've been perimenopausal for several years now, and I've been waking up every two hours and having hot sweats." And these people are walking past me with their <laughs> shih tzus, going, "Oh, poor woman." <laughs> <laughs> Really is shih tzu for you, Emma, isn't it? Yeah, really? Shih tzu, yeah. Oh, actually, I love boom. your dad jokes, Terry. You're just oh, like, oh, here all week. Every time. <laughs> do you know what strikes me about all this though it's like firstly on the one hand I feel really sorry for GPs my god mm. they've got so much on their plate oh, god, right yeah. and yeah. it's and, and that was from pre-pandemic as well yeah there's yeah. been so much change going on in the NHS and you know we could talk about that for hours we saw the Davina documentary earlier this summer there was that thing about GPs signing up for training wasn't there mm. I think mm. Terry you've been having a quick look at this haven't you I have what's, what's been going yeah. on with that so um, Dr Louise Newson, so my menopause doctor, was in that Davina documentary and off the back of it, her and her team offered training for anyone in a healthcare profession who wanted to um, find out more about menopause. So she created a course called Confidence in the Menopause and incredibly, I think the last time we looked at this there'd been a couple of hundred GPs had signed up for it. Do you want to guess how many people have signed up for the course since that documentary? Ooh. Um, thousands? 5,000? And the rest. Come on, come on, girls. I'm hoping more, because even that's a small amount, isn't it? Maybe yeah. 7,000? Bina? I'm hoping, I'm optimistically going to say, well, I don't know how many GPs there are in the country, but I'm hoping all of them. <laughs> That'd be good, wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah. They've not done it by GP, actually. They've done it by healthcare professionals. So in both okay. the UK oh, okay. and Ireland, there have been 10,000 people have signed up. Wow. To... That's that brilliant. Is good. That's amazing. That is it amazing. Is amazing and is there it? any and indication of if it's male and female or is that, is that I, data I don't not? think they're, um, they're aggregating those they're not, statistics. No. Um, or if they are, they're not sharing them on, the, on Twitter. <laughs> um, no. but, Things are travelling in the right direction, aren't they? They are. I mean, do you want to? Do you want to know? You can actually offer the course to um, to your GP. You can actually download a free flyer and give it to your wow. GP practice oh, really? to tell them. Yeah. So she's uh, so Louise Newson's got on her website. Emma, you flyer. should have staple that to your pres- your prescription and taken it to your GP. I can but still do that. That's you still a can. Great idea. Okay, G for GPs. Uh, Helen, what have you got as your G? I have gone for jeans. Because I am really fascinated. We hear so often that it's um, you take after your mum, right? Ask your mum what her experience was at Perry and Menno. And I've spent about five years thinking, right, my mum just stopped her periods at 47. And then after that, she felt brilliant. So I've spent most of my 40s thinking, I've just got to get to 47. But that might not be the case. Um, because we've spoken to a few women on this podcast, actually, who didn't necessarily take after the mum. So that made me think, right, I need to look into this. Now, when you look into, like, it's the whole nature or nurture thing, right? And when you Google it, it's like there's so many differing opinions over how much you inherit and how much you don't. And I was thinking, OK, this is not as cut and dried as I thought it was. But I did find a really interesting article in New Scientist, which has just come out recently. And this is actually about the age at which you go into menopause. And the reason why they're studying this is for infertility reasons. And they're actually studying this in order to see whether or not they can shut off certain gene variants that cause your eggs to die more quickly, which is what sparks off the menopause. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating. Now, how many eggs do you think we're born with? Do you know? No idea. No idea? Tens of thousands. Right, a million. A million eggs. A million eggs, right? And by the time we get to sort of perimenopause, menopause, it's down to about a thousand. Okay, and that's how many many eggs we lose. So... This wow. study, it's an international study looking at the genes of 200,000 women of European descent and 80,000 women of East Asian ancestry. And they were looking at these genetic variants that influence how old you are when you go into menopause. So they found this gene variant called CHECK2. This is what's involved in the eggs dying off. So the women who have genetic variants that stop CHECK2, on average, experience menopause three and a half years later 
than women who don't have these genetic variants that stop check too. Oh. And so the, the, this quote that I read from this researcher says, these findings pave the way for more detailed studies that could lead to women being able to predict their menopausal age and to consider options to extend their reproductive age span. I mean, that's bonkers, Ooh. isn't it? It's bonkers, but I'm not sure I like that. They're looking at this in the context of helping women who are having IVF releasing more eggs because in them potentially the eggs are dying off more quickly mm. that's the context in which they're looking at this right okay great right time for another g bina what have you got i'm gonna go a bit childish i'm going with gonads oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you'd think right, right so I, I something when, when you when you said helen about right is g something in the back of my brain from like gcse level biology went we have gonads women have gonads right but what? you always yeah. So so basically, I think, you know, we talk about gonads in terms of blokes, <laughs> bollocks, basically, don't we? We and talk about testicles. Bust the gonads, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. me too. <laughs> <laughs> um, but really, uh, so so in fellas, the, the testes, yeah, uh, that produced uh, sperm, testosterone, all those things. And in women, it's our ovaries, our our gonads are our ovaries. I'm sorry, I just can't help but laugh every time you say that. Uh, do we actually have? <laughs> are you comparing them, or funny. do we actually have gonads? No, no, so how, no. They are, are they the, the actual term. Gonads? The official term for our ovaries. So it's basically it's where our reproductive hormones are created. So in men, it's it's the testes, and in women, it's our ovaries. I love that. I'm just googling gonads, see what comes up. I know your face. Oh no, is don't do that. Just you, might get, <laughs> yeah. you might get. Yeah, might get dodgy pictures. <laughs> And I'm oh. not Google image searching, no. Yeah. <laughs> Ugh. Certainly not. Yes. No, uh, Bean is absolutely right. Gonads are glands that produce gametes. Mm -hmm. The female gonads are ovaries. Oh. The male gonads are the testes. Well done, there Bina. I never knew that. Love yeah. it. A little bit of trivia there for you. That's really interesting. So when they say, like, grow a pair to women... <laughs> yeah, well, you know... we already got a pair, baby. Yeah, we've already yeah. got a pair. You just can't see them. Yeah. <laughs> We keep ours hidden. Terry, what have you brought to the table in terms of G? Well, carrying on with the alcohol theme, but not really alcohol, I thought um, I'd look at G for the medicinal benefits of gins. So, Ooh. yeah. Like with actually a bit of, mother's with, ruin gin? Well, I, was gonna, I wasn't going to do that, but I was going to do it with a twist. I was going to do like ginger and ginseng. But actually, okay. I've, I've included gin as well, just because I think we need that in there. So basically, the reason I've... I came up with this was I was researching different options for HRT and basically herbs or herbs as they say in the states god don't say that it's awful it makes me cringe yeah no <laughs> Herb, herbal it makes herbal. me cringe no yeah no I no, hate no, no, it as well herbal it literally, herbal. It literally herbal. sets herbal. me on edge right ginseng there was a review published in 2016 in the Baltimore Medicine Journal which is available on the United States National Library of Medicine website for anyone who wants to look at it and it showed that half the women they reviewed who were menopausal had used complementary and alternative medicines. And ginseng was the most frequently used herb for menopause. What's so, going on with the American accent, Terry? Because it, it's, it's, it's an American, American review of all the research oh, done okay. into no. ginseng. Basically, the different research has found different kind of red ginsengs or, or ginsengs. There's one called Korean red ginseng or KRG which has helped improve sexual, sexual function and libido in postmenopausal women. I wondered whether we might have a little, um, a little run on it. Like, we could can, certainly try it, can we? I'm willing to try yeah, anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, um, give it a go. So I, it might have like the Nigella effect, you know, when she said goose fat and everyone went out and got goose fat. So it's called Korean red, <laughs> Korean red ginseng. But the cost of it, so I had a little Google just to see how much it costs. It really varies. So online, some of the bottles of it for 100 pills are about £12. Holland and Barrett sell it, and they've got like 100 in a, in a box for £18. And then you can get it in Harrods for £350. Oh, my goodness. Really oh my so you can get this like... God. Yeah, so this is Korean red ginseng, so like an extract of it is £350. OK, so that's, that's ginseng. Ginger is the next one. So Anne and Joe, who are two ladies who set up something called Positive Paws website, it's positivepaws.co.uk, they've talked about different herbal teas and um, things like that that can help with menopausal symptoms. So basically they've talked about ginger. Ginger is really good for 
things like nausea and also your digestion. But it's also an anti-inflammatory, so it can help with aches and pains as you start to get, which is something I get. Now I've got like arthritis in my hips. It's, you can often get a lot of aches everywhere else as you sort of compensate for walking and everything. The final G is G for gin. And that's the one that's made from juniper berries, which is like a super fruit. So it's not a herb, but it's a fruit. Since medieval times, gin has been used as a herbal remedy. So it's really good for fighting infection. It prevents heart disease and it can improve circulation. And also it hey, listen apparently... Hey, you drinkers. Yeah, well, yeah. This, is, this is the ironic thing I found, is that it actually can fight kidney disease and liver disease. Oh. Whereas I really? thought, you know, the whole what? mother's ruin thing, that gin was actually what caused these things in, in women, wasn't it? Is but, it um, that you have to take it in moderation, Terry? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, yeah, if it's meant so. to be taken medicinally. <laughs> yeah, not like Rather three than... times a day, yeah. Two double gin and tonics, like, you know, back to back. <laughs> yeah, well, the tonic's good for you as well, isn't it? If I press this button now, I can order some red Korean ginseng to be ordered by one o'clock tomorrow afternoon. Very Ooh. good. There you go. For nine ninety nine, And I'm not ordering it from Harrods. They can bog off. <laughs> £300? Yeah. Pound? They're joking, isn't it? Yeah, I might have £350. Ugh. Yeah. Oh, God. 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 Effing hormones. Chatting perimenopause in public. So what of it? Time now for you to hear from our guest for this episode, Marnie Riches. Now, Marnie's a writer. She writes crime novels uh, featuring brilliant, feisty and kick-ass women. And I love this description that we found of her online. It says she's been a punk, a trainee rock star, a pretend artist and property developer and professional fundraiser. She's also a single mum who's raised a family while battling really difficult perimenopausal symptoms. We'll talk about that in a bit, of course, because that's what we're here for. But we'll also talk about the difference between Marnie and her mum's experience with Perry and Menno. Now, Marnie grew up in a pretty tough area of Manchester, I think it's fair to say that, in the UK, and ended up at Cambridge University. So she's had quite a life, and we are thrilled that she's with us. Hi, Marnie, how's it going? It, I, I'm very well, thank you, yeah. I'm a bit discombobulated, which I think is, is usually how I am, because I'm perimenopausal. <laughs> <laughs> so, I just feel like the last couple of years, I, I have very few functioning brain cells anymore. What I didn't kill off with gin did get killed off by hormones, so... Well, that's another way of describing the brain fog that we've all experienced. Yeah. What, what are some of the, the worst manifestations of brain fog for you then, Marnie? Well, actually, things like this, where you suddenly have to go from loading a wash into the washing machine or stacking the dishwasher or shouting at the kids to putting your professional head on. I find the transition really odd. I think that's also a symptom of lockdown is that, you know, you, you kind of sit down and you're still in like full on bimbo mode where, you know, you're just worrying, <laughs> worrying about keeping people fed and, and out of A&E. <laughs> and then suddenly you have to, you know, be coherent and, and talk sense. It's difficult, isn't it? Do you do that thing where you get halfway through a sentence and it's your sentence, but you've forgotten how you're going to finish it and you had no idea what you're talking oh, about? Constantly. Do you get that? Yeah, 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 yeah. And walking the whole walking into a room and thinking, what the fuck am I doing here? You know, where are my glasses? <laughs> oh, they're on my face. Where are my slippers? <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? And when, when I used to think of my mother doing that, I always used to think, oh, God, that's just something that happens when you get old. But it's nothing to do with being old, is it? It's to do with hormones. All of those years thinking, silly old bastard. I am now the silly old bastard. <laughs> <laughs> do you know yeah. what, Marnie? I, I genuinely, I appreciate your honesty because I did. I used to, and I think back to what I was like now, and I think, God, you were so impatient. It'd be like, with my mum, I'd be like, come on, come on, like this, you know, oh, teenage. God. Today, my son... I mean, I went upstairs and um, I'm going on this business trip to London tomorrow and I'm carting the kids with. And I was, I was having to pack and my son had just left about half of his wardrobe scrumpled up on, on a kind of wicker <laughs> sofa in his bedroom. And I couldn't tell what was clean, what was dirty. And I've done nothing but lay into him all week. And I'm like, get up here, you little bastard. <laughs> I thought, Jesus, this is shades of Jess. So that was my mum. And uh, she used to, my mother used to get so irate with me when she was 
doing the menopause and I was a teen, she used to stand, she was only five foot, she used to stand on a stool to lamp me. <laughs> she said, oh my get over here, little bastard, while I hit you, I'll smack you around the ear hole. But I, I don't hit my son, but I did say, look at that state of your bloody clothes, you dirty little shit. And then, like, <laughs> ten minutes later, I'm, do, you know, I'm having a go at him for not wiping something that was my fault. I should have wiped it. But it's that horrible clash between being utterly menopausal and, and overstretched, which I think women in their 40s and early 50s generally are, until you start that mix, lovely slide to retirement. And then, and then teenage kids. It's an incendiary combination. So poor little. It's bastard. amazing we're all still alive, really, isn't it? Well, he's going to have to. He's going to have to do sciences so that he can pay for the therapy. <laughs> <laughs> so when your mum was going through it, then Marnie, did she um, talk to you openly about it? Did she explain it? That you know, did you understand why she was getting so irate and jumping on stools to punch you? Yeah, I mean. I, co I come from a family where all the men were dead or divorced and all the women were like alpha little fighters, you know, mm. on a rough estate having to fend for themselves and bring the kids up. So my auntie Millie was like that and my mum was like that. And all my, you know, all these kind of older women and my auntie Lily as well, used, well, they all hated each other, but they're all dead now, so I can tell you about it. They all used to congregate in various <laughs> kitchens, you know, smoking B&H and, and moaning and, and talking about the bodily functions. So, you know, there was absolutely no taboos at all. It was a very working-class, woman-centric upbringing for me, uh, which is nothing like the kind of middle class, well, we don't talk about poo and we don't talk about periods. You know, and all, all these kind of bodily fluids and or lack thereof. You just, you know, in in the household I grew up in and all my relatives, anything was fair game to talk about, which was incredibly freeing. Gosh, so you grew up knowing that um, you may look forward to vaginal dryness later in life then, by the sounds of it. <laughs> yeah, my mum used to go, oh, my flu's so sore. <laughs> my poor flu. Oh. Just call it a flu. <laughs> Up your flu or up your clute. There was always, you know, <laughs> many turns of phrase of inserting things into her for JJ. So um, that's your new book, Marnie. That should be your new book. All the all the different expressions <laughs> for a lady's flu. Yeah, I think hoopla is my favourite. Oh. I've never heard of any of these before. Have you guys heard of these ones before? I've heard of it. Yeah, I've heard a couple of them. Yeah, only for JJ so far. I should qualify that my nickname is Filth Wizard. So. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. But it sounds like your mum went through um, perimenopause at 39. I mean, that's fairly young, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, she was really young. And, um, yeah, I mean, she wasn't in any kind of a relationship, so there wasn't any man to consider. So there was that, which I guess might have made it a bit easier for her. And I was really young at that stage. Yeah, I was about 10 when she was going through the menopause. But it seemed to last for years and years, you know, the kind of... And she got the bad sweats and she was a foul-tempered motherfucker, really. Although I loved her very much. But Jesus, she was like this tiny little woman with such a short temper and a big gob on her. Very Mancunian, you know. And um, the neighbours got it in the neck. I got it in the neck. <laughs> How did Everyone, that go down? Like a broken lift, really. I mean, she was always starting trouble with the neighbours and the young kids in the area, the, the kind of feral kids on our estate. Well, she used to grass them up to the police, you know. So they, they were starting with the wrong one because the, the nick our bin, our black bin, and take it onto the hills, which was just like an old bomb site in Cheatham, and set fire to it. And she'd just run after them and batter them. <laughs> You know, she just wasn't taking any prisoners and, and it'd escalate from there. So it ended up, you know, we kind of had years of escalation and it all went a bit dark. And that's why I write crime fiction, children. Tell us what it was like. Well, by the time I, I got to 16, 17, it had got really bad. So the, the little gets off the estate had turned into big gets. And um, my mum just lost her rag all the time and used to run after them and then she'd grass them up and then instead of just letting the rabbit out or setting fire to the bin it started to get bricks through the window and eventually it was petrol bombs and 
constant windows being smashed. We ended up with the back of the house, every single window had been boarded up and we had a security door. So it was terrifying. I had to go to school in um, in my own clothes because the, otherwise they'd spot me in my kind of posh kid uniform because I, I got a free place at Manchester High School for girls. And, uh, you know, we were fearful for our lives and we had to move it as an emergency measure. But I, I don't think that my mum's menopausal rages really did us much of a favour because she just wasn't having any, you know. Do you know what? I don't think I've ever heard of anyone being petrol bombed if they hadn't, you know, willingly taken part in some sort of war or riot or, or protest. Well, I think I mean, the you, point you is just that attacked. where I used to live, it was a war zone. So the coppers always went onto the estate. In the end, you know, uh, they never went onto an, uh, the estate alone. And if they drove onto the estate, they'd go in someone's house and regularly would come outside to find that their squad car had been firebombed. And it got, yeah, it was really terrifying. It was so bad that um, my old headmistress had to have words with um, John Anderton, who was the chief of police at the time. And then they did a big raid, but half of the policemen ended up in uh, in hospital with broken this and that because the kids, you know, sabotaged them. So we've talked um, in previous episodes about, like, the impact of stress on perimenopause and menopause. I mean, this can't have helped your mum, can it? Oh, no. I mean, while I've been going through perimenopause, I've been lucky enough to live in, in quite a kind of quiet suburban area but my mum was in the thick of it she was in an urban war zone having to uh, bring a kid up on you know below the poverty line and um, mm. and had she didn't have a boyfriend or anything so there was just this network of kind of older female relatives for support and my mum wasn't really one for pals she didn't really have many friends she was quite a loner in that respect so she was having to deal with all this on her own and the way she dealt with it was well, she smoked a hell of a lot and in the end lung cancer took her. So mm. she paid the price for that later on, unfortunately. And, um, yeah, it was, it was tough going for both of us, you know, but particularly for her, I can't imagine how she got through it all. Well, it's even more extraordinary that you ended up going to Cambridge and becoming a writer then, in a way. It's like quite, it's quite an unusual background for someone at Cambridge, I imagine. There, well, there were quite a few working class kids at Cambridge at the time and it's certainly got better since then to the extent that a few of the colleges now have about 80% state school kids. But I bet you can still count on only one or two hands the number of kids that have come from proper sink estates. And certainly mm -hmm. at the time, there was only me and one other lad in my college that had come from genuinely impoverished background, single parent, rough as arseholes. But I loved it, you know, and, and to them, I think, you know, I was kind of a curiosity. It's like, oh, Marnie, you're so gritty. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love your, your working class edginess, except, you know, you get a couple of arseholes who were like, everybody is sick and tired of your foul mouth. <laughs> and my answer to that was, well, go on, fuck yourself then, if you can't deal with a bit of the vernacular. <laughs> Fantastic. So do you think actually seeing everything that your mum went through prepared you for the menopause or did it hit you like a, a ton of bricks, like it hit most of us really, were a bit unprepared? It sneaked up on me. It's sneaky, the menopause, and you don't realise yeah, actually until you're right in the thick of it that all this horrible shit that's going on with your body and your mind is perimenopause. So that's what happened to me. And once I sussed out what it was, it was a lot easier to get my head around because I'd seen my mum and my aunties and go through it, you know, and moan about it vocally and laugh at, you know, some of the more ridiculous things that you have to go through. Um, yeah, it sneaked up on me. So, you know, I'm thinking, why is my skin going red? Am I drinking too much gin? You know, why am I suddenly really anxious? Is it is it just that all that shit that happened to me when I'm younger is suddenly coming out? Is it just that my ex-husband has got the wrong ankles and he won't put the bins out? <laughs> you know, all, <laughs> yeah. all these all these things. And 
shitty sit why am i getting recurring utis you know have I, have I inherited some terrible pipes off some relative you know <laughs> and and then finally you piece bits of the jigsaw together and you think aha i have solved this mystery i am perimenopausal so you didn't go to a doctor or anything to, who told you then you just sort of worked it out yourself no, I just, I just kind of, uh, I went and got individual symptoms treated, but there was no one there taking an over, a kind of holistic overview until I saw a female GP, and I kept going in with these raging UTIs, and I've got scarring on my left kidney actually because I'd had them so frequently, but sometimes I'd send we in and it was clear, and I spoke to this GP, and she said. You've got what I think you've got, genitourinary syndrome of menopause. And I think that always treating it with antibiotics is not the right way to go. If there's infection there, then that's fair enough when we treat it. But if not, you're going to have to manage the symptoms of urethritis. And she referred me to get, you know, the camera up your pipe. And um, and they had a look. That's the scientific term, by the way. And they had a look. <laughs> yeah, <and> the, <laughs> thought so. <laughs> they could see that there was no tumours there or anything because I've always been one of these that if I, you know, fart crooked, it's cancer. Yeah. Well, it's always a, it's always the worry, isn't it? Especially if it's in your family. Then yeah. Well, happen. exactly. Yeah. yeah. You can't be too careful, really. So we were treating individual symptoms without realising the overall picture until she said, "Well, I think it's this." And uh, and then I started to put two and two together and started to Google symptoms properly because my mum had suffered from being an arsehole and, you know, angry and <laughs> really bad flushes, terrible flushes. But I don't get flushes. So no. I'm an arsehole, but a lot of the <laughs> symptoms are different and I have more symptoms than she had, but not your classic, you know, not your archetypal flushes. What are some of the other ones that you get then that, that really worry you? And oh, God, what don't problems? I get? So the brain fog and the, you know, the kind of vaginus collapsus totalis, my dusty box, as I like to call it. <laughs> um, the GSM and the kind of boozer's face. Christ, what else? Uh, irregular periods. Um, the anxiety, the spikes in anxiety. I think a lot of it was down to that. Um, see, I can't remember now. Classic. Brain fog, like the rest of us. It's like it's like there's a bloody the electrical connection goes, isn't it? You could be Aww. like having <laughs> some erudite conversation or whatever, and just suddenly it's blank. It make you know that bit I find really difficult. It just makes a tit of you. You know, people are looking at you thinking. Well, especially if you're probably like in in front of your students, or especially for me if I'm on air, it's just it's yeah, it's more well, like, embarrassing. Just but I'm just telling my students. Yeah, that's what I say. But you've got to make a point of mention, haven't you? You've just yeah. got to break this taboo, which is why we're doing the podcast. So we've got to keep mentioning it. And I make sure I tell everybody I meet, like, oh, this this morning I had to go to work and. Um, me- this poor guy who I was literally only just met and I'd offered to make him a cup of coffee, he had to remind me three times to finish making the coffee for me. <laughs> oh, mate. Cheeky little bastard should but... have been making it for you. <laughs> well, no, well, he should have, shouldn't he, really? But he was, but I was hosting him, so I, I should have, really. Oh, right, but in the, end he had to, in the end, he did have to make Here's his own coffee. coffee darling. But that's it. It's just... It, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, menopausal anger. Oh, yes, plenty of that. But we never actually talked about whether you did HRT. Did you go down that route? No, I haven't. No, because I've been perimenopausal without realising and struggling along for so long. And it's that whole thing of not kind of taking a holistic view of the symptoms and seeing them as a whole that I didn't realise until I think I'm on the cusp now because my period stopped for three months and I felt fucking great. Absolutely brilliant. Ah, that was it. Yeah. So my worst symptom, I think, is chronic migraine. So certainly oh. I, I got a, a migraine aura. About, it's about two years ago now. And it lasted three months, a migraine aura. What? And I had to go to the <gasps> eye. Yeah, I know. It's so shit. I had to go to the eye hospital uh, to check if my retinas are detached or not. And oh they, my God. I was in there a full day and they were doing all tests and stuff and dilating my pupils to check that it wasn't that. And they said, and I had a brain scan a lot, kept getting terrible headaches. It started with the aura, got to headaches. And the MRI was clear and they said, oh, it's 
it's it's probably just your age. It'll just be hormones. And then at Christmas, I got a migraine Great. and it wouldn't fucking shift every single day. And then the doctor said, well, it's chronic migraine and this is a common thing with perimenopausal women. And I spoke to a few mates and they're like, oh, God, yeah, I had that. That was really sucky. That was horrible. But don't worry, because once you get past it all, the migraines go. And I think it is this thing of if you're at the very end and then like I had these three months with no period and I felt fucking great. No migraines, decent energy levels, something approaching a, a libido. I mean, my period kicked back in, but I just thought once I've got past that 12 months of no period, I might feel like a human being on the other side because I think your breasts start to produce estrogen then, don't they? And that's why you're breast can your breast cancer risk goes up i think everyone's so individual because i haven't had a period for over two years and yeah. i am sweating and having hot flushes like a bastard and mood oh, swings God. and i'm still going through it two years after not having a period so well, this is probably like with me and birth i've got a couple of mates that go oh well i feel absolutely fabulous now i'm out the other side and all my symptoms have abated and i'm like yes that's going to be me but having said that when i got pregnant all my mates were like, oh, well, I just breathed the baby out. And it was like having really bad period <laughs> pains. And I just, I had, I just shat the baby out on a tarpaulin at home and natural oh birth and no God. blah, 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 blah. And, and they must have had a fanny like a horse collar because I was in labour for fucking <laughs> three or four days. And I was trying to labour. Me too, I, I had this bloody Me optimism too. going, oh, well, I'm just going to breathe the baby out. It'd be such a lovely, lovely maternal an earth mother egg you know experience <laughs> and like by the end of it by the end of it i'm like get me the fucking get me a fucking ambulance i want another chocolate no, bar and pissed off i want an epidural you, you <laughs> fucking twat this is your fault you bastard <laughs> and next minute i'm being carted <sighs> off to the hospital and they, they give me gas and air because the fucking gas and air canister at home the little uh, portable one hadn't worked and the poor midwives that were kind of sitting vigil you know um waiting for me to shit this kid out and it didn't happen they must have been like get her in and give her the big tank anyway they hooked me up to this giant tank like a bloody b52 and they said oh well you're only supposed to breathe the nitrox uh when you're having the height and your contraction and they're trying to drag this fucking thing off me i'm like get off get off get off i only got one puff of it before i got an epidural <laughs> Oh, well, Girl, I mean, it, I... It, it is absolutely I brilliant, the, epidural the gas, and to be we're frank. still chugging on it. I was absolutely <laughs> off my tits and it was fantastic. So, really, I should take the HRT because the drugs work, girls. Um, but I think it's this ridiculous optimism that I always think that I'm going to sail through this shit and I never fucking do. So, maybe mm. I w I've not ruled HRT out. Did you learn anything from your um, from your mum or from the other women in your family about how to handle some of the symptoms that you experience? Just acceptance, really. Acceptance and making sure you get plenty of kip when you're tired. You know, the fatigue's a real, you know, that's bone crunchingly hard, especially when you do a really thinky job like me. And, you know, I'm having to write two books a year and teach. I teach at Salford University at the moment at the postdoctoral school and I run a Faber uh faber academy online novel writing course you know these are all pretty you know intellectual pursuits so i have to have an afternoon kip as my mum did you know so i think the main advice which i've found is great you know great coping mechanisms are a, if i can get it a daily disco kip it's really essential if you can take that time out for a nap it's a lifesaver, isn't it? It, really it is. is. I mean, obviously, a lot of women are in nine to five jobs and they can't necessarily do that. But, you know, I think that employers are having to become more aware of menopausal women and they should actually be offering nap spaces in the workplace, I think. So napping, giving zero fucks really helps. Um, <laughs> That's I'm, my favourite prescription. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, and um, I think... Getting your head around it, you know, owning owning this kind of change in your body and the kind of elder status that you're moving into, 
I think is a really positive, because a lot of it is positive frame of mind. If you go into this with the anticipation that you're going to stay box fresh like you were in your 30s, you, you're setting yourself up for a nasty surprise with or without HRT. But if you kind of embrace the kind of positive changes that come with growing older, so you might get clanky knees, but you're acquiring wisdom. He was going to say, what are some of the other positive things then? Because it's and it's very easy to dwell on the negative, in, isn't it? When you're, you know, consumed with pain and yeah, exactly. lack of sleep it's, and it's all of this. It's easy to treat everything as, as lack and deficiency. And, yeah, you are lacking some, you know, you, your oestrogen levels plummet and you're often vitamin deficient. But if you eat well and sleep well, then you can turn to the good stuff, which is... Um, a sense of self kind of under inhabiting this new skin, this kind of different skin that you're in and owning it and being happy that you've reached this stage in your life where you know better. And, you you know, we're, we're the sandwich generation, aren't we? So we've got kind of rickety parents above us that are a responsibility in a time sink. And we've got kids beneath us who are, you know, again, a huge time sink, money sink, responsibility sink, although we love all of these people dearly but the beauty is that we know what we're doing we're finally at a stage in our lives where we've, we've accumulated all this can do all this wisdom and you know i'm not bothered that i've got cellulite on my bingo wings i'm i'm feeling good about knowing what i'm talking about being good at my job um gaining respect as a person professionally and on a personal level. So it's all about embracing the future you and this next stage of your life and not looking back. I was I was speaking to Helen the other day about there's a YouTube clip of these actresses, Hollywood actresses, who are celebrating their last shaggable day. And and they have a picnic what? because Hollywood actresses, until they get to a certain age, are, are always kind of cast as to how bonkable they are, how box fresh they're looking, how much they look like, you know, still look in their early 30s and with pneumatic breasts and tiny waists mm. and fucking thigh gaps and all that shite. <laughs> and they, these, these women in this little sketch, you know, they actually sit and have a picnic and drink champagne and say, here's to our last shaggable day, because they're, they're in the kind of, you know, mid to late 40s and have finally got to the stage where they can be cast in proper character roles and be taken seriously rather than uh. just being, you know, am I shaggable? Does this man fancy me? Can I compete with the, the kind of younger, fertile, you know, pneumatic women with these tiny waists? And it's like, I don't want that shit anymore. I'm, I'm glad to be free of it. I'm going to grow out my pubic hair and plait it like a fucking Viking. <laughs> <laughs> Amen Do you know to that. Yeah, do you know what, man? It's so refreshing to hear this. This is just exactly what I needed to hear, I think, because I think I've spent the most of my life being immature and being a child, but embracing that and enjoying yeah. it. Yeah. And I'm always thinking, but when will I feel like an adult? When will I be secure in my uh, knowledge that I'm good at my job or that yeah. I'm worthy or, and that I don't give a shit? And it literally has only happened in the last couple of years. So it yeah. literally has only happened when I've hit menopause. You know, it's yeah, taken me exactly. 50 years to think, OK, I'm an adult now you know. so what you lose on the roundabouts you're definitely gaining on the swings i think so i see it as a net gain <laughs> a net gain i'm getting more hair in different interesting places more <laughs> wisdom more kudos more money you know it's like when beyonce gets to our age she's gonna write a really good song like you know destiny's child did you know Shoes on my feet, I bought them the car, I'm driving, I bought it. You know, and I'm definitely like that. It's like, you know, driving a big car, it's like, is she a middle-aged, you know, a middle-aged mum in an anorak or is she a drug dealer? Oh, yeah, I am that. <laughs> I am that cool, you know. I, just, fuck it. Oh, I love you know, it, I love it. Speaking to you, I'm just desperate to read your books now because you've got such a wonderful turn of phrase. You know, what you lose on your roundabouts, you make up for on the swings. Yeah. I just love the way you speak. I just can't wait to read it all written down as well. Well, it thank sounds you. sounds fantastic. Well, all my heroines, actually, I need to move into the realm of a menopausal heroine because the book I'm writing at the moment, my new heroine, Detective Jackson Cook, she's named after Jackson Pollock, so she has, like, an arty father. But she, she's a... 
pregnant in her 40s, so she's already got nine-year-old wow. twins and then falls pregnant again. So I'm I'm kind of talking about the whole experience of of being an older mother. You were going to put make your next make your next um, heroine of your book a menopausal heroine. Yes, I would like to. Yeah, um, and and bring some of this experience to bear. You know, and some of the humour that comes out of some of the situations that you find yourself in as well, because you know it's absurd some of it. It's always the kind of laughable old woman. But, no, there's not many kind of middle-aged women in the late 40s and 50s that are going through this. And there needs to be. Um, there's a novelist called Helen Fitzgerald who writes crime fiction. Who She wrote, I think, the first novel, crime novel I've seen um, with a menopausal main character who's a probation officer and just having to, you know, deal with all the shit that comes her way with, with all the sweats and stuff. But... Um, I'd like to bring some of my own experience to bear on that. Effin hormones. Sweary, but supportive. Exciting times, because it's time for the Perry Perry Grilling. Marnie, are you ready? I'm always ready. Ooh, I say. Well, first up is Perry Trumps. Now, you've got to think top Trumps. Um, but for perimenopausal symptoms. So, first of all, if you go onto our website, under features, you'll find all 34 symptoms of peri and meno, and they've all got a score, uh, but this is according to how rare they are. Please note, this is not necessarily medically factual. It's basically Helen doing a quick Google. So your rarer symptoms will have a higher score than hot flushes, which I'm still annoyed about. But anyway, there you go. So what are some of the rarer ones that you've had then, Marnie, out of our list? Well, my most recent one is digestive problems. I get allergies, but I can't fucking remember what they are. No. um, (laughs) Irregular heartbeat. That's, oh, God. I've always had an ectopic heartbeat but the palpitations in the middle of the bloody night absolutely awful really terrifying and sometimes i'm lying there they're frightening aren't they they just don't go for hours so that's that's been a real pisser hair loss i've got what's called androgenetic alopecia which means that i'm getting a receding hairline so that's nice that's attractive my milk so i'm guessing all the boys to the yard (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> so I'm guessing you've got quite a high score on um, Perry Trumps then Yes, I can't add up very well But I, I believe it's in the high double figures 79, yeah. we 79, totted up 79, yes We totted it up earlier mm. So I'm just trying to think actually Yeah, you've got a couple of people ahead of you from the previous series Sue Devaney, bless her, won Because this is the game that you really don't want to win no. so, 125 And then, oh I think Colette actually had about 97 so, so yeah, you're kind of middling, Marnie. You're middling. Yeah, well, I'm just about hanging on in there with my compacted bow. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Perish the thought. Right, shall we move on to our next uh, fun game? Um, it is now time for the Effins. It's a little bit like the Oscars, but much better, because you get to nominate someone who's helped get you through all this, Marnie. So it could be like a mate who's helped you through. It could be somebody in the public eye, maybe, who you admire for raising awareness. Or it could be someone medical that's helped you out. Who are you going to nominate for an effing? I'm going to nominate my friend, Professor Caro Bainbridge, who I went to college with and I've known her for 30 years. And she was going through Perry a few years ago and uh, kind of first made me aware of the ills of it and she's she's got through it now and has come out the other side and she is fucking fantastic she's a year Mm. older than me so she's 51 and she's an academic um and she's perhaps the cleverest woman i know and i'm very cool and um yeah she's she's got through it she's out the other side and um and she's kind of one of these elder states women you know, so I, I'm going to follow in her kind of... I'm following downwind of her kind of thing. Well done, Yay. Caro. Yay. Well done, Caro. Yeah, fabulous. And finally, you get to choose a tune for our very prestigious Spotify playlist. So this is where you get to choose a song to represent your menopausal experience. So it might be the song that makes you get out of bed or makes you feel like a badass woman or a song to express your rage, just yeah. or something just to soothe your um, stressful headaches. So what are you going to choose for our playlist? 
I'm going to have Yes, it's fucking political by Skunk and Nancy. <laughs> Yay! Hey, because it's um I mean, I love Skin and have have always loved her in an almost biblical way for decades. Um, ever since the band, you know, um came to came to fame, you know, and um that is a very angry, shouty song. And yeah. and being being a woman is very political and being menopausal is also very political and everything is fucking political. <laughs> so um Yay! I'm gonna go for that. Good choice. And fun fact, on the day that we're recording this, it is actually her birthday, Aww. so I'm sure she'd be Happy thrilled to birthday know. Skin. Yeah, well, she certainly doesn't look her age, does she? No, but she's um, I had the pri- pleasure of speaking how, to how her a couple of months ago, and uh, I can't remember off the top of my head, but I think she's a bit older than me, so I'd say she's early 50s, oh. but she oh. um, is definitely menopausal, so we did have a good, good chat about brain fog and um, an hot flushes. Woman. Yeah, she really is. Love her. Aww. Yay! Hooray! Oh well, thank you, Mon- Marnie. You've been an incredible guest on Epic Hormones. Thank you. Education. I think, I think every everyone knows a little too much about me now. But <laughs> zero fuck skills. Zero fucks. <laughs> well done, lady. And we that you. is why we love you. <laughs> thank you. Well, that's it for this episode of FN Hormones. Thank you so much for listening. You will, of course, hear from us again in a couple of weeks' time. I do want to do a shout-out, though, to everyone who's written an amazing review to us. And a big shout-out to Beata and Sarah, who sent us emails that actually made us feel pretty emotional. There were tears, but thank you so, so much for bothering to write to us. And welcome to the gang. Big news, you can now also check out our new Facebook group. Just search F in Hormones Podcast and it should come up. Uh, just a little spelling tip here, that is F in with no G. And we'll see you there. Uh, do remember, of course, to rate, review and follow F in Hormones and tell whoever needs to know that we are here for them too. Bye. Yeah, yeah, yeah.